The problem with truly great people is they really don't know how great they are. You know, you know what I mean? Have you noticed that about them? And, and there's some young people here who do, don't know who the Tuskegee Airmen were and what it means. Us old, older people, we know. And I, I don't want anybody here leaving without understanding. During World War II, we lost more people in bombers than if you took all the people that flew the bombers, we lost more died than lived. It was, it was the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous jobs you could do in World War II. It was rare to just survive more than a few hours in combat. I mean, they, they just fell from the sky. And one of the jobs of the fighter pilots was to escort those bombers and keep that from happening. There was one unit, and that was where the Red Tails, that never lost a bomber. Now, imagine that. You know, it, it, uh, the, the heroism of that. But there's a lesson for the young people here to learn. And there was a reason for that. You know, the reason for that was, is because of the politics and the, and the hatred of the time, it took a while for African-American uh, fighter pilots to get into the war. But they had a commander that didn't waste that time. All right. These guys practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And when they got there, they were the best fighter pilots the world had ever seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to say hello to you. It's wonderful to be here. One of my jobs in the Air Force was to take care of an airplane like this replica. It's down to details like red tail and the number on the side of the fuselage. That was my airplane. Couldn't eat with it but I sure slept with it sometimes. <laughs> you don't normally get credit for doing a good job. And I know there's many of you out there that have done outstanding things that you should have been rewarded for. But that's not what it's really all about. He knows that. He knows that there are a lot of people depending on him doing a good job. Because without self-sacrificing people like that, the things that need to, get to be done, need to get done don't get done. There are a lot of people sitting around here that are in that situation. And it's extremely important that you give accolades to these people. I think you all know who they are. Now, a little bit about me. I consider myself extremely lucky. I got a chance to do what I like to do. I got paid for it. How about that? <laughs> That's wonderful. Many people don't get that opportunity. So I feel very, very lucky and blessed. I remember building airplanes out of tissue paper and balsa wood. That's how much I in love I was, even as a little tot. I always wanted to fly. And I almost gave up hope that I'd get a chance. Well, after I retired, I mean, after I came back from overseas, I was stationed at Lockburn, Columbus, Ohio. And I decided I would take a portion of my GI Bill and go out and learn how to fly. I did that. Now, I didn't advertise the fact that I did it because I'd heard the stories that the Air Force didn't appreciate necessarily you uh, haven't had that kind of experience because they felt like <laughs> they're the only ones that could do it right. <laughs> but anyway, it sure came in handy. <laughs> At least I knew which part of the airplane was the front end. <laughs> so I was very lucky. At 
26 and a, 26 years and three months old, I got into the flying program. Now, I was surrounded by a lot of young guys who were fresh out of college with a lot of vim and vigor and all that kind of carrying on. And I said, wow, man, this is going to be tough. But I didn't realize I had an advantage. I already knew a whole lot of stuff that they didn't know. It worked out. So I got a chance to fly. Wow! <laughs> I can't say in mixed company what it's like. But I can give you an idea. Like the bestest meal or the bestest anything you ever had. That's what it's like. Okay. So I spent about 22 months overseas with the Tuskegee Airmen. And my job was a crew chief. I had responsibility for I had the responsibility for an airplane. And I tell you that was really something. I had been prepared by going to aircraft mechanic school, so I knew basically. But guess what? The airplanes we had there wasn't the airplanes that we learned in, that we learned on. So that was brand new. <laughs> so you didn't have anybody to help you. You didn't have an assistant. You were there, and you didn't have anybody to hold a flashlight at night, so you stuck it in your mouth. <laughs> Spent a lot of nights doing that, getting it ready for the next day, because I knew that the man flying that airplane was depending on me doing it right. And that motivated me. And I'm quite sure that you are motivated by the same thing that people are depending on you to do the right thing and to do it right. That's important. And for the youngsters out here, if you don't get that message, you have missed a biggie. Because your whole quality of your life from this day forward depends on how well you perform. Because people are watching and they will pick and choose to get the best that they can because they are depending on you doing the right thing. And you are going to stand out. So it's important. I'm very, very into youth because they don't have the experience. They don't have the luxury of having experience and know when something is right or something is <laughs> a little bit on the shaky side or what have you. But that's so important to the quality of your life from this day forward. So I'm into youth. I had the great fortune of flying with a young woman, 15 years old, from Compton Airport to Virginia. Her name is Kimberly Anyadiki. have two parents that are unbelievable. I'm kind of jealous because they are about the best I have ever seen. Those kids, 3.7, something great average, you know, things like that, on the roll, da, 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 plays piano, plays violin. <laughs> what do you want to do when you grow up, girl? Pilot? I thought to myself, I didn't say it out loud. Well, she answered the question and said, cardiac surgeon. Well, I said, she didn't aim low at all, did she? <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, at a time when you look around at your youth and you're worried because the way some of them are behaving, and you go, Wow, we're in trouble. 
But thank goodness, there's at least a couple that I know. <laughs> no, it's more than that. But anyway, <laughs> three maybe. Okay. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is very important. We have to help the youngsters. It's not up to just the schools, but we have to help the youngsters in every way to make it through this life. It's extremely important. The quality of this life and the quality of this country staying what it stands for, those are the things that you're going to have to wrestle with. And if you prepare yourself now, you might be able to do a halfway decent job. Because some of those that we got, sure not. But in the has another story. Uh, being fortunate and having exposure, I was lucky enough to have met Don, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King when I was down in Alabama going through squadron officer school. My wife had the luxury of being only three doors away, and she had a chance to spend quite a bit of time talking to him and what have you. And through her, I learned some things, and finally I got a chance to meet him and what have you. Man is unbelievable. I can't believe what he went through. So later on, about well, 12, 13 years later, I had a gentleman that uh, was in Las Vegas, and he was fairly well known and involved. And he was concerned that Martin Luther King was coming to Las Vegas to speak. And there had been threats in the paper on his life and what have you, so he called me. And at the time, I was still on active duty and what have you. So he said, will you go down and um, sit in on this meeting to see what's going on? And I went down, and knowing a little bit about security, <laughs> I sat and listened to the discussion of what they were going to do and how they were going to plan the route. And I, the more I listened, the more alarmed I got. The place was going to, the meeting was going to be held in a wide open, you, you know where the, uh, what's the name of that place? Las Vegas, uh, um, Silver Dome? You know, in the, the dome where they have. It's wide open. I mean, you know, it's nine million places in there. So I addressed the <laughs> audience and I said, uh, how would you like to be the sound that Martin Luther is assassinated in? I said, what you're proposing to do doesn't provide any protection at all. Because I knew what that place was like. Three floors, you know, with openings, 10 or 15 of them all around on each floor. So they said, well, what do you propose? I suppose we <laughs> propose we have a sweep, top and bottom, a person at each one of those entries. Nobody's allowed above the ground floor. And the route that he has to go and what have you. Now, you know what got me? I went back and told Dr. King what I had proposed to the, to the people in charge there. And he says to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really concerned about my life. Wow. Man, that got me. And I knew, listening to his voice, that he believed what he told me. So fortunately, I sufficiently scared the people that they didn't want to have that kind of thing happen in Las Vegas. And they did what I requested. 
went off fine. But it just shows you, you never know what role you're going to be thrust into. And you have to believe in your heart that you're going to do the right thing. And it's important, very important to each and one of us to continue doing the right thing. We all know what the right thing is. We've been screamed and yelled at and beat up over it time and time again. So we know it by heart. If we were forced to, we could say it. <laughs> so this is about youth. I mean, we've screwed up everything, you know, the older folks. So, well, darn near. <laughs> no, but seriously, seriously, when you look back and think of the opportunities that went, boom, and you didn't speak up, or you didn't do what you really should have done, could have done, and what have you, we can't do this with youngsters today because I tell you there are some problems coming that's going to be unbelievable. You're going to say to yourself, how did, can this happen here? And we are the ones that have to be aware of this now and start now. Get these kids the best education they can get. And you know, that's puny when you stop and think about it. You know, I'm not talking about guns and what have you, because if you don't have the background, you're not going to be able to do anything if you, if you had a gun. You knew what to do with it. So the, so the deal of it is, is this is our hope, is that we take care and make sure that we support people like this who are trying to improve the quality of the schools and the quality of life so we can gain what that has to offer.